Gender and the Union is a podcast exploring why policy changes matter in combating gender-based violence in the European Union, and why relationship and sexuality education is key to creating a more equal and safe future for all. In this four-episode podcast series, we will create a dialogue between policymakers in the EU and the young people looking to advocate for positive change. Welcome to this episode of Gender and the Union. My name is Catherine Bailey Gluckman, and I'm a programme advisor and project manager on youth related work at the International Planned Parenthood Federation European Network. In this episode, I'll be discussing the prevention of violence through education and the dismantling of harmful gender norms and stereotypes. And joining me to do that are the President of the Commission for Citizenship and Gender Equality of Portugal, Sandra Ribeiro, and our youth activist, Susan. Sandra Ribeiro has been President of the Portuguese Commission for Citizenship and Gender Equality, or CIG, since October 2020. She was Director General in the Directorate General for Employment and Professional Relations from 2018 to 2020, and during 2017 and 2018, she was Chief of Staff to the Minister of Labour, Solidarity and Social Security. Prior to that, she served as President of the Portuguese Commission for Equality in Work and Employment from 2010 to 2014 where she developed activities in international working groups in the area of gender equality and was also part of the executive board of the Equinet Network. As you may be able to guess from that long history of engagement with workers' rights, Sandra started her professional activity as a lawyer in the area of labour law. We are also joined by Susan. Susan is a member of the Estonian Sexual Health Association. She is 24 years old and a mother of one. She is an educator facilitating relationship and sexuality education courses. She's currently engaged on the project Youth Spect Actors, where she is a moderator in theatre based workshops in which young people who participate literally walk in one another's shoes to help challenge and dismantle gender roles. She is also an actor in a sex positive play called How to Say Yes, which is a project formed of real dialogues from young people about sex, sexuality and relationships. Thank you both very much for joining me today. Let's get right into it. So Portugal currently holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union. The presidency is responsible for driving forwards the Council's work on EU legislation and policies and for ensuring cooperation among EU member states and promoting EU values. Uh, Sandra, can you tell us please, what have been the priorities of the Portuguese presidency when it comes to promoting EU values, including the advances on gender equality and combating gender-based violence? Okay, thank you so much for your question. Um, yes, uh, Portugal is uh, is being the president. Oh, it's, it's already almost done for this semester. Uh, it ends in the end of um, June. Um, and um, until now, um, the work that we've been done, our priorities, um, the topic of violence against women and domestic violence is definitely one of the most explicit uh, concerns for the Portuguese presidency and as well uh, is something that we shared by with the German and Slovenian presidencies as well we uh, we made this trial and we've been working together very much to calling for high standards for preventing and combating all forms of violence against women and girls and as well to protect and empowering victims and survivors from gender-based violence everywhere in UA. Uh, with this in mind, we, uh, we support, of course, the European Commission uh, a session to the Istanbul Convention and any other measures to combat gender-based violence. So one of our, um, as one of our uh, Portuguese presidency priorities, uh, we um, hosted a, a very important high level conference on the, to signalize the 10th anniversary of the uh, Istanbul Convention. It was happened uh, last April, and it was a unique opportunity to take stock to uh, the implementation of, um, of this uh, convention and to uh, reinforce the high standards 
and debate the implications of the COVID-19 crisis as well on the violence against women and domestic violence, particularly in terms of patterns and dynamics of violence and to analyze the state and the civilist society responses. Uh, as you know, um, uh, we have some problems with these um, with the Istanbul Convention. Like uh, we have almost, uh, I think we have six or seven uh, member states that didn't ratified yet uh, this convention. And so um, a lot of work has been done and must be keep on done to trying to uh, ratify this convention with all, by all the member states. Maybe this is, can be difficult and maybe something must be done uh, we have to to see what what other um, what, what are the uh, dimensions can be done. But for now, we have uh, this new uh, UA strategy on victims' rights as well, 2020 to 2025, and this um, strategy pays a lot of attention uh, on the needs of victims of gender-based violence. So I think that one of our priorities it is as well well to um, stress the, the need and the importance of uh, making this strategy come true in all the member states. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we have been very glad to see the Portuguese presidency taking these steps, pushing forward these priorities, uh, especially as it comes to the Istanbul Convention, which protects women from violence and is a, a very important tool uh, in all our areas of work. Like we will um, hear a little bit more about that later on. Um, let's stay with this topic of violence against women for the moment. We know, according to data from the European Institute for Gender Equality, that in Estonia, 33% of women over the age of 15 have experienced physical and or sexual violence. Approximately 44% of women have experienced some form of threatening sexual harassment. And 39% of people in Estonia say they know a woman within their circle of friends or family who has been a victim of domestic violence. And we all know that barriers to reporting mean that those figures are likely underestimates. So those are the statistics for Estonia. Susan, what are the challenges that young people in particular are facing in Estonia concerning violations of gender equality? Hello, thank you for the question. And uh, I can talk only from my own experience. And uh, mine show the biggest differences appear at workplace. I am a mother of one. And like when I was pregnant, I had a lot of issues at work. I worked in a studio as a game presenter and because of my appearance changing, my body changing, the firm couldn't have me in front of the camera anymore. Uh, they hired uh, me and two more people to train other game presenters, but they paid them more than me for the same job, telling others that it was because I submitted a temporary incapacity sheet which I did not. <laughs> I wanted to address the issue, but every time I tried, I was ignored. And then it was already time for my maternity leave. And after my maternity leave, I actually went back to work and got a chance to become a floor manager. On the first day of training to become one, I asked about opportunities to like bump out breast milk for my baby. And I was told that they would get back to me on that. And a few hours later, it was announced that they gave my place on the training to someone else who, because uh, I needed extra breaks. I was told that I should have actually thought about it before even considering of coming back to work. And I think it's a very good example of a situation of being discriminated because of your gender. Because like no one would ask a man to think twice before going back to work after the baby is born or pay them less for actually having one. And this problem of being people being stereotyped to fit the mold, some jobs considered manly and some are feminine. And a job is a job and we shouldn't find it weird when a man is a kindergarten teacher or a woman is an electrician and we shouldn't discriminate them because the choices that they make like in the family or in their own life. Well, that's 
enormously uh, frustrating to hear about your own very acute experience of that kind of discrimination on the basis of gender in your in your work there. Um, we know that you are confronting these kinds of uh, stereotyping and discrimination around gender in other areas of your work. Um, can you tell us a bit about what you have been doing to confront some of these issues? Well, I personally think that the most effective uh, like projects or ways to confront these things are um, projects um, with an art value and that give people the opportunity to decide for themselves what is right and what is wrong. We are all different uh, in all different stages of development and have different experiences. And therefore it's very important that the education that we give is flexible to everyone's needs. And that's why I'm actually very happy to be a part of two amazing projects like Youth Spect Actors, where boys and girls who participate literally walk in one another's shoes to help challenge and dismantle those gender roles. And then th there's this other project that I'm in, um, how to say yes, a play that talks about sex and everything that comes with it in the words of young people themselves. Fantastic. Susan, could you tell us a little bit more about this Youth Spectators project? What kind of activities do you run with the young participants? Well, the main idea of the Youth Spect Actors project is to give the youngsters different scenarios to play out in each other's shoes. That means that boys will play girls and vice versa. And afterwards, we will have a discussion and ask them, why did they choose to act this way? Why did they act like, why did they choose to speak in high or low voice or sit in a specific manner? And uh, do boys or girls actually act this way or is it a stereotype? And if it is, then where have they seen it or heard it before? Uh, and this is, the way we can reveal what are the harmful gender norms and how they play out in reality. Like, for example, young men are often expected to suppress their emotions so that they can confirm like to damaging understanding of strength and masculinity. This leaves men ill-equipped to express or navigate through their emotions, which can later on cause issues for their mental health. Equally, young women are often expected to be polite and accommodating to others even in situations where they are actually made to feel uncomfortable. Confirming to these expectations can make it more difficult for women to assert themselves and then can lead to enduring discrimination or abuse without possessing the skills or confidence to address it. I mean, I'm a very confident women, woman, but at my workplace, I, I still wasn't heard. So if I'm a woman who's not that confident, how can you like fix it for yourself? Wow, it, it certainly sounds like a very powerful tool for using with, with young people at your level locally and nationally. Uh, we have talked a little bit about the Istanbul Convention as a very powerful transnational tool. And as Sandra mentioned earlier, we are actually marking 10 years since the signature of the Istanbul Convention this year. That is the Convention Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women. It's the most important international treaty of its kind. And an issue of great concern for us is that there has been a lot of recent backtracking from countries who uh, initially ratified it or committed to it, as we have mentioned. We know that both Estonia and Portugal have ratified the convention, which is great. So let's talk a little bit about some of the successes of the Istanbul Convention. Sandra, can you tell us about some of its main achievements and what would you say to other countries to incentivize them to make their own commitment to it? Well, Istanbul Convention, as you said, um, is the most advanced and comprehensive um, international legal instrument to prevent and combat violence against uh, women and uh, domestic violence. And we need to stress this as many times we need. Uh, the, the United Nations refers uh, to, to this convention as the gold standard. Um, and actually it is because the convention offers a 
absolutely complete kit of tools to prevent and combat the various manifest manifestations of violence against women and girls, uh, including online that digital violence, which is growing exponentially. And this is very important because once you are under the convention, you starting to be in this uh, group of support. You are uh, submit to evaluations from uh, Gravio, uh, which is um, from the from the Council of Europe that help all these member states that are under the convention to really fulfill the application of this convention. So you once you are ratified the convention, you are not alone uh, in the implementations of the measures and uh, all the um, the actions that um, Istanbul Convention can offer to you. So th that's something that I think that this is very important to stress. Of course, that we, we are in the in the last years and especially a couple of months um it's been quite scary when we see that uh, there are some countries that want to get out from the uh, the, the, the convention um and and i must tell you that it was very important for us uh, when we made our conference to finalize the the 10th anniversary of the convention that the um, polish government said uh, in that convention, because uh, a representant from the Polish um, government said that they will not going away from the convention, that they would they ratify and they will keep it on. And this is very important because um, it's an important statement and is a role model for many other countries that are having second thoughts about uh, keeping on the convention. So what I'm what I what I would like to say more uh, to all the the countries that uh, still didn't uh, ratify the convention is please do it do it now uh, do it as fast as can because it is very important um, because um, it's the right uh, thing it's the right movement to uh, join to our fight against domestic and gender violence. Thank you, Sandra, for that very clear and powerful summary of what the Istanbul Convention really means. We, along with the entire international community, will be hoping that the Polish government really does keep its word on that statement, and we will be looking to our European decision makers to hold them to it. You've described there in a very concise way that the Istanbul Convention offers a toolkit to those who subscribe to it. As you said, when a country ratifies it, they have access to very practical guidance in achieving the common goal of protecting women's lives and to the support from all other countries engaged in work towards that goal. So it's about joining a community for sharing best practices and about benefiting from the knowledge other countries in that community have already gained in this shared struggle for human rights that goes beyond our national borders. Of course, in this moment, when we're looking back at 10 years of the convention, um, possibly the most important factor in all of our contexts right now is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pandemic has obviously impacted all of our lives, it has meant the closure of all public amenities in many places, including schools, and that means halting relationship and sexuality education for a great number of young people. We know that, like many members of IPPF, the Estonian Sexual Health Organization, which is Susan's organization, has made some great efforts to continue providing young people with these crucial life skills through online means when face-to-face -face delivery has been blocked. Susan, can you tell us a little bit more about what you have seen this year in the digitalization of sexuality education? Mm, like you said, especially with COVID-19, many young people were at risk of being deprived of sexual or any other ed education for that matter. And uh, I think the digitalization is a great way to reach out to even more young people than before. And young, young people go to online anyway to get information on sex. So we might as well put out the healthy and accurate information. 
Uh, during quarantine, Estonian uh, Sexual Health Association held uh, those sexual health courses for young people and their parents through Zoom platform. But uh, in my own opinion, I don't think that uh, the digitalization is better or will replace live courses because the, those themes are so intimate and nothing gives a better feeling of safe space than face-to-face -face interactions. But it was still a very nice touch uh, throughout the pandemic to give out those courses in Zoom um, for people who don't have sex ed at schools. Thank you. That's, it's, it's very interesting to hear your experience and, and your opinion on this. I know that your, uh, or one of your primary engagements in sexuality education is this project that's theatre based. So it needs people to be in the same place and, and seeing each other's faces for it to function. Um, we know that we're at this point now, we're seeing all sorts of evidence emerging on the impacts of different modes of digital sexuality education. It is still very much a new and developing field um, and we have also seen you know some of the great positive effects of running sexuality education online is that for some people digital tools can reduce stigma uh, and ensure confidentiality especially if you have a mobile phone and you're accessing education that way no one else uh, needs to know that you're doing it um, which can remove uh, a major barrier for for young people to to access access and maybe what we're looking at in the future is hybrid approaches mixing digital care with face-to-face -face integrations more like the ones you're involved with Susan as a, a way to to harness those gains to reach youth and other other vulnerable groups Actually, I would like to add something to that. Uh, like you said, it's a very good thing for uh, youngsters to be anonymous when they get their information. They are more um, like they're not afraid to ask. Like you said, it takes away the barrier. But actually, if we there's a minus two because if everything goes uh, digi and digitalized, then uh, young people kind of lose the way to interact with each other. So that's why I think it's very important that we can use both, but we need to use both. We can't use only one. Yes, yeah, so uh, certainly different organizations will have had uh, different experiences and something that we we will look to see in the future is how we can take what we've all learned about delivering sexuality education online during this crisis and see how best to uh, make the best use of that going forwards as some organizations and countries return to more of a normality. As that happens as well, uh, we also are reflecting on another hidden pandemic that has been revealed by COVID-19, which is domestic violence, uh, a topic that Sandra referred to earlier. We've seen evidence of enormous increases in different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, and that includes intimate partner violence. And what has happened in COVID is people, including children and younger people, have been confined in homes with their abusers. And that has been one of the reasons that we've seen this, this mushrooming in violence, which has been very concerning. Sandra, what are practical actions that the EU can initiate to empower EU citizens to ensure the safety and dignity of people who are at risk of that kind of violence? Well, um, I think that it's pretty much clear now that the restrictions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic um, lead to an increase of uh, domestic violence. Uh, national helplines for victims of domestic violence across Europe have reported increases in requests for help. Doesn't mean that we are that we have an increase of um, of complaints, uh, formal complaints, but uh, requests for help we have a lot, and we have uh, definitely a, a major increase. Um, and uh, I think that we. When we, when we look to the AIG study, 
about the COVID pandemic, um, COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, intimate partner violence against women in the UA, in the, in the, in the European Union, um, we can see that we have the highs in reports all over uh, of, uh, in domestic violence during the confinement um, connected with COVID-19. And we have this sad warning that women often face the greatest danger is in their homes with the people with they are living with. And this is, um, this is quite important to realize that um, many times the, the worst of the enemies of violence, domestic, of domestic violence is our home. Uh, so we need to, um, now when, we, when we're going to, um, when we are building this um, recovery strategy at this moment to, to, to recover from COVID-19 impacts, I think that this is very, very important that we can have a gender-based um, vision when we are a scope, when we are designed the measures of recovery and uh, in our national plans. We have a structural persistence of male violence against women and girls. So what we have to do is, um, is to have a direct action in this field where we already know and now it's not it's more just more much more than talks much more than conversation we have numbers we already have uh, facts uh, and numbers data are are the most important um, tool to uh, design the best policy uh, policies that we can have so what i think that we need is really to um, design our recovery in a gender mainstreaming approach, especially focus on the structural persistence of male violence against women and girls. We really have to understand where are we failing until now, why this keep on happening, and we have to work there precisely. So I think that is about this is the moment where we have the plan re recovering plans to uh, designing at this moment is to really to take measures in school um, training uh, information it starts on school the best prevention we can do is starting with the child it's starting with the education education of the professors of course education of, of parents and education in families, but education of the youngers. So it's very, very important to work all together in this. And I think that this is the moment uh, when we are recovering, when we are doing the recovering national plans is where we have to uh, design uh, these measures in a, again, in a gender mainstreaming approach to really change something. Thank you, Sandra, for that uh, very comprehensive set of strong ideas about concrete actions that the EU can take to combat, as you have named it very clearly, the structural problem of gender-based violence. We've got time for one final question to both of you. I'd like to start with Susan and ask you, what is the one change in the world that you would like to see happen today to prevent sexual and gender-based violence? Mm. Because I really agree what Sandra just said, uh, that it would be that I'd like to see relationship and sexual education programs included into school curriculums as their own subject. I also think that teachers are not given enough support to roll out relationship and sexuality education, the training of teachers to cover certain aspects of relationship and sexuality education, like gender roles, sexual abuse and domestic violence are frequently neglected. Thank you. And Sandra, with that in mind, what is the one action that you would call decision makers to take in order to make that one wish of Susan's a reality? Well, yes, I really agree with, uh, with Susan what, what, when, uh, with her answer. So my answer is very connected with 
the uh, answer and as well with my previous answer as well. Uh, I think that uh, a very important thing is, uh, as I said before, is the, the training, the joint training. And in Portugal, at this moment, we are launching uh, an annual plan for joint training in violence against women and domestic violence for public administration. This is involved in the first phase, of course, the teachers, but we are going to be, we need to go further. We need to um, be more, have a more wide approach. So we are, um, we pretend to involve five different governmental areas, internal administration, justice, education, labor, solidarity, and social security and health. And what we want to do is to make a big uh, training program for a lot of civil servants in these uh, five areas. Spread information and training is the key to prevent and combat gendered violence. So what we want to do is to, um, of course, starting on schools, but go to the other sectors, especially the public uh, sectors engaged with, uh, with, with these matters, so we can guarantee that from now on, we have a standardization and a coordinated procedures to define where and how to react uh, in to prevent uh, situations of domestic violence. It's fundamental, and especially to give um, the courage that the victims need to complain. Because what we see many times is that we don't, sometimes the victims don't trust um, in public service. They don't believe that they can help them. So it's very, very important to make this training, to make this capacitation of our civil services that work in these, uh, in these areas. So the victims can feel that if they going to ask for help, they really find people that are um, training for help them. So I think this is the great, uh, the, the, one of the great measures that we can do is to uh, bet, to make our bet in a strategy for training. Thank you so much to the both of you for these very clear, very comprehensive and very connected thoughts. It's been very interesting hearing how the operations at your engaged in, Sandra, are really reflecting very clearly the concerns and the experiences that Susan has brought here today. We've heard from our guests how harmful gender norms are at the root of gender-based violence. That means that we need to take them seriously and combat them seriously. We've heard how this can be achieved at different levels and how it's especially important in light of the COVID pandemic to consider underlying inequalities that exacerbate conditions that lead to violence. The Portuguese presidency over the Council of the EU has taken very clear steps to hold member states accountable to respecting EU values, which include advancing gender equality and combating gender-based violence. They've also been a firm supporter of the Istanbul Convention as a way to improve the lives of women and girls by providing states with clear practical mechanisms they can use to keep their citizens safe from harm and coercion. And let's not forget the convention specifically mentions education as a way to prevent violence. We've heard from Susan about how the situation looks among young people in Estonia how archaic gender stereotypes continue to affect young people's lives professionally and personally, but also how there are promising projects and initiatives running that aim to provide relationship and sexuality education as a route to a future free from violence. We now look to the EU to continue to support civil society organisations who do this crucial work in preventing and combating sexual and gender-based violence. Thank you for listening and do look out for our next episode of Gender and the Union. This podcast series was commissioned by the International Planned Parenthood Federation, produced by Positive Stories and funded by the Rights, Equality and Citizenship Programme of the European Union.